one of the things that um, you got to understand is whenever you're involved in a war, there are rules of engagement, rules of engagement. There are specific guidelines as to how to conduct yourself in a warfare. In, in the natural um, life that we live, there are rules of engagement. There's the United Nations, you know, uh, there are different pacts, you know, the Warsaw Pact and different things like that. And um, there's the World Council and they are governing bodies to determine how to conduct warfare, even though it's nation against nation and people are literally trying to kill each other, shoot each other, bombs and whatnot. But yet still, there are rules, rules of engagement, things you can and cannot do. And that's why we have things like war crimes and people tried for war crimes, you know, uh, when you have human uh, human rights violations and, thing, and things like that. There are rules of engagement. Well, just so naturally, just so spiritually, there are rules of engagement and there are things that we need to understand. Right. And that reminds me as I'm saying this, I know I in my day job, I drive for a living. So I'm always on the road. And one of the things that I notice is people, bad drivers and bad drivers. What makes a, uh, somebody a bad driver is not that they can't control the vehicle. It's not that they don't know how to turn left or right or how to match the, the accelerator or the, or, the, or the brakes. What I've noticed with the, most of these people that are bad drivers, they have not studied the manual the highway code. They don't know the highway code. So they don't know when to go on a roundabout, who's the, when to go, what to do, how to conduct yourself, how to switch lanes, you know, using your indicator. There's a lot of things they don't know. And I can tell they have not read and studied the manual, you know, so they don't know the rules of the road, the highway code. They don't know the rules. It's very similar to in a war and you don't know the rules of engagement. You're going to mess up. You're going to get in an accident. You're going to crash. You'll crash and burn. You know, you'll take lives with you. You'll mess up. You know, you've got to study the manual and you've got to know the rules of engagement. All right. The same thing that makes you a good driver, study the, 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 the highway code. Same thing that makes you a good Christian. All right. You've got to study the rules of engagement. Now, our main text is Ephesians 6, 12. And from that, we're going to get into some definitions and whatnot. It goes like this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, <clears throat> the word wrestle is translated from the Greek word pale, pale. And it means a contest in which each combatant tries to throw the other down and hold his opponent down with his hand upon his neck. That's the actual description in the Strong's Concordance, right? And I like most Greek and even Hebrew words, there are multiple meanings and different nuances and whatnot, but this is very specific. And so when I began to look at this definition, I realized, you know, the spirit of God began to impress upon me. Why did God use the word wrestle? And that word wrestle, that word parlay, this is the only place in the entire Bible it's used. That word is used nowhere else. The word wrestle is in other places in the New Testament and, and the Old Testament, but it's a different word. It's not the same word. All right. So this is unique. So this type of wrestling is, is only for this particular concept, wrestling with the enemy, wrestling with the devil and demons and fallen angels. That's how this um, is applied. This concept is applied. And I think it's very specific and <clears throat> because the meaning of the word wrestle, what is wrestling? You know, what there, there are different types of um, combat sports. There's boxing, there's martial arts, there's even mixed martial arts these days, big thing, you know? There's um, all sorts of, there's Kung Fu, there's Ninjutsu, there's Aikido, there's Taekwondo, you know, many different martial arts and different types of um, combat contact uh, 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 sports and so forth. Wrestling is unique in that when you look at all the other types of combat sports and martial arts, they're all about striking and hitting the enemy using your fists and the palms of your hands and your feet, your knees and, and stuff like that. Wrestling is different. It's, it's, it's strange that in wrestling, these things are actually illegal. You cannot strike with the, with the fist or the palm. You can't strike at all. There's no striking. There's no kicking. There's no kneeing and elbowing. There's none of that in wrestling. <laughs> and it's unique. It's unique in the, 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 the combat sports, in, in, in the contact sports, right? And, and combating. It's unique in that. So, 
what you find happening is when you look at the basic guidelines for a wrestling match, one, the wrestlers shake hands and action commences on the referee's whistle, right? Each wrestler attempts to take his opponent off his feet and to the mat, to take him down to the mat, right, for a takedown. The top wrestler, the one on top, attempts to keep his opponent under control and holds his shoulder on the mat for at least two seconds. If he can accomplish that, this is called a pin or a fall, and the person wins. The one on top wins the match. So the purpose of a, of a wrestling match, how you win it, is you take your opponent off their feet, put their back to the mat, and you keep them pinned on. You, you dominate them. You take control of them, and you keep them down. That's how you win a wrestling match. And I thought it really, really unique and, and interesting, you know, and even intriguing that that is the word that God used to illustrate our combat, our contest, our battle, our warfare with the devil. He used wrestling, not boxing, not martial arts, not kung fu, <laughs> not ninjutsu. He used wrestling. So how you how you win a wrestling contest is by keeping your opponent down and subjugating them, dominating them, controlling them, and keeping them pinned down. Do you begin to see it? That's what the devil is trying to do to us, and that's what we have to do to him. We, each of us is trying to keep the other down. <laughs> right? But I have good news for you. You see, Luke 10, 18 says in the, the um, God's word translation, it says, Jesus said to them, the disciples, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. How do you win a, a wrestling match? You take your opponent off his feet, you throw him down, and you keep him down, and that is called a pin or a fall. When you put the, the, your opponent down on the mat and you keep him down, it's a fall. A pin or for you pin him or it's a fall. That's that's the technical term to, to, to illustrate or demonstrate how you win a wrestling match. You have to make your opponent fall. Jesus said, I watch Satan fall from heaven. <laughs> you know what that tells me? It tells me Satan is a defeated foe. When Jesus died on the cross, and then resurrected from the dead three days later, he defeated Satan in his wrestling match. It was Jesus and Satan, and Satan tried to defeat Jesus when he first came out on the scene, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days and, and 40 nights, and Satan tempted him three specific times. That's Satan trying to pin Jesus. He was trying to throw Jesus off of his feet and pin him to the mat. You see, that was the wrestling contest there. And Jesus won that first wrong. He won the first wrong. And in the second wrong and the final wrong, <laughs> when he went to the cross and he died for our sins, paid for our sins, buried three days, resurrected from the dead in victory and glory with eternal life for all, he pinned Satan to the mat. <laughs> he pinned him because he specifically said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He pinned him. So that tells me that when the Bible now tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, human beings, but against, and it goes on to list categories of different spirits, but basically Satan and his kingdom. We wrestle against Satan and his minions, his fallen angels, his demons. That's who we wrestle against. When the Bible tells us that, we have to put that now into perspective. We have to understand that Jesus already pinned Satan. He already won the match. Jesus wrestled Satan personally, and he pinned him to the mat. He saw Satan fall like lightning. Satan already fell. He's pinned to the mat. You see? Let's go back now to the, the definition of wrestle from the Greek, parley, a contest in which each combatant tries to throw the other down and hold his opponent down with his hand upon his neck. When Jesus resurrected from the dead in victory, he pinned Satan to the mat. 
And then he gave us the authority. He said, behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. All right? You shall tread on serpents and scorpions. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. He gave us that power. He gave us that authority. He gave us the victory. So the reality of the situation right now, the reality of the contest, the fight, the struggle, the, the, the wrestling match with, with, with Christians and Satan, with you and I and the devil, the, the reality is he is already defeated. He's pinned to the mat and our hand is upon his neck, keeping him there. That is our position. That is the reality of our situation with Satan. We have won. Jesus already won. He is fallen. Satan is fallen. He's pinned to the mat and we have our hand upon him. Jesus gave us that victory. He put us in that position when he resurrected from the dead. When you receive Jesus as your savior and Lord, he just, he, he tags you is what he does. He just tags you. He's in the, 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 the ring. And his hand is upon Satan's neck. And he tags you, come, come, come. But he keeps one hand on his neck and he tags you with the other hand. And you come in and you put your hand on Satan's neck. And he never moves from there. He never moves from the mat. He's pinned. And Jesus just tags you in. When you get born again, you're tagged into that wrestling match. You see? And that is the reality of the situation. So how is it you say that, you know, <laughs> is that, if that's the reality, how do we have all this, this, this fight and this struggle? You know, why, why the, the health problems and the financial problems and the relationship problems and why all of this? See, the devil's only weapon, as I shared with you last week, is your ignorance. You don't realize the situation. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know that he is a defeated foe, your hand is upon his neck, he's already pinned to the mat, and you have the victory. You don't know that. Christians don't know that. So he now deceives like a roaring lion. He roars, roar! <laughs> you understand? And he makes a big fuss. And when you hear the roar now, you move your hands up and you throw your hands up and you say, oh my God, he's roaring. And you move your hand from his neck. And you let him up. So that he can now continue to deceive you because of your ignorance. You don't know. You didn't realize he was already a defeated foe. Your hand was on his neck. He was pinned to the mat. He couldn't move. He couldn't do anything. But he roared. <laughs> he just made a loud noise. That's all he did. As a roaring lion. As a roaring lion. He just made a loud noise, roared, you got scared, move your hand from off his neck and let him stand upon his feet. Now that he's standing upon his feet now, he can actually go out now and try to deceive you further. He still can't do you anything because remember, rules of engagement. He can't hit you. You're wrestling. You're not boxing. It's not Chinese Kung Fu. It's not Jinjitsu. It's not Taekwondo. He can't hit you. It's a wrestling contest. To, to, to win, he has to put you down on the mat. He has to put you flat on your back and do the same thing. Keep his hand upon your neck. That's how you win a wrestling contest. He can't hit you. Do you understand? So he's now trying to get you off of your feet. Why do you think the Bible says over and over and over and over and over? Stand, therefore. Stand, stand fast, stand in the liberty, stand in faith, stand. Right through the Bible says stand. Why do you think it says stand? Because you're in a wrestling contest. And once you are standing, you're winning. Once you are standing in a wrestling match, you are winning. You're not losing. You can't lose. The only way to lose a wrestling match is when you get on your back. You have to fall on your back. That's why the Bible says throughout the, 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 the narrative, stand, 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 stand. Even Ephesians, it said, stand therefore with the whole arm of God. Having done all, guess what you have to do? When you've done all, guess what you have to do? Stand. <laughs> all you got to do is stand. We don't know that. Many of us don't know that. Christians don't know that. So our ignorance defeats us. The devil roars. And he messes with your, your finances. And he's just, all he's doing is roaring. He roars and he messes with your health. He tries to steal your health. He's just roaring. The reality is by Jesus' stripes, we are healed. That's the truth. So it doesn't matter what sickness the devil tries to put on you. He's just roaring. It's a roar. It's an illusion. Yes, it might be a fact. You might be sick in the body. There may be health concerns. You may be feeling pain, discomfort. It may be a fact, but it's not the truth. 
The truth is you are healed by Jesus's wounds. You are healed. That's the truth. <clears throat> so even when he tries to put sickness on you, understand you got to keep standing. How? In faith. <laughs> Stand in faith. <laughs> Stand in the liberty that Christ has made you free. Right? Don't be yoked again in the yoke of bondage. Do you understand? You got to stand, stand in faith, be, trust God, believe God, stand in the confidence that, hey, the devil is a defeated foe because he is. Jesus said, I beheld Satan like lightning fall. He got pinned. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, he got pinned. <laughs> Let's press the one. <laughs> Pali. <clears throat> that word is translated wrestle is from the, 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 the root word palo. It means to vibrate. Palo means to vibrate. So I'm looking at this and I'm wondering what, what is God trying to say here to us? He's saying, this is how you actually win the wrestling contest. This is how you stand. How do you stand? Pale from palo to vibrate. This teaches us how to wrestle. We wrestle with our words. You see, sound is a type of energy made by vibrations. Pale is from palo, which means to vibrate. Sound is a type of energy made from vibrations. When an object vibrates, it causes movement in surrounding air molecules, which makes them bump into other air molecules, creating a chain reaction movement of pressure waves. This is what we call sound. Sound is just vibrations. So when you open your mouth ha, and you speak glory to God, death and life is in the power of the tongue. When you open your mouth and you speak and you decree and declare, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of God. Hallelujah. The words out of your mouth create vibrations. Hallelujah. And it is those vibrations that affect the molecules ha, in your surrounding environment. Glory to God. And you shape the world around you. Hallelujah. Demons and devils got to bow. Hallelujah. When you speak the word of God over your situation, over your circumstances. Hallelujah. When you speak, you create song vibrations which affect the molecules in the air in the environment both naturally and spiritually glory to god hallelujah demons and devils got to tremble they got to bow ha! when you speak the word of god over your situation you are standing when you speak god's word into your situation that is how you stand and once you're standing you're winning the wrestling contest because the only way to lose is to get off your feet on your back. It doesn't matter how much he roars. It doesn't matter how loud the roar is. It doesn't matter how broke, how much the bills pile up, how the, the condition of the finances, your physical body. You could be like Job scraping boils. It doesn't matter. All those things doesn't mean that you have lost. Because it's a wrestling contest. The only time you lose is when you are flat on your back, pinned to the ground. Therefore, stand. Doesn't matter what the situation looks like. It's a fact. It might be a fact, but it's not the truth. Even if you're struggling financially, the Bible says you are blessed and highly favored of God. That's the truth. Even if you're, you're, you're struggling to pay your bills this month, the Bible says that God has made you rich. Jesus made himself poor so that we might become rich. Glory to God. The Bible says uh, God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There's so many wonderful scriptures that confirm, hallelujah, that we are financially taken care of. It doesn't matter how the situation looks. Never be moved by facts. Be moved by the truth. The word of God is truth. Your situation is a fact. Your circumstances are facts. <clears throat> You're struggling to pay your bills. Those are facts. <clears throat> You're sick in the body. Facts. <clears throat> your relationship is in jeopardy. Facts. Not the truth. 
those are not the truth, those are facts. Truth trumps facts every time. Because facts are temporary, the truth is eternal. It lasts forever. The word of God is truth. Speak the truth in and over your circumstances. And that is you standing. And once you're standing, you cannot lose because it's a wrestling contest. This is just the first page. I have several more to go. <laughs> Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Of course, this is Jesus Christ. Confirming what I was just sharing with you. The Net Bible says, the same verse, it says it like this, disarming the rulers and authorities. <clears throat> he has made a public disgrace of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It explains things a little clearer. This just confirms that he, what he said, he beheld Satan like lightning fall from heaven, pinned to the mat, glory to God, pinned to the earth. Luke, 9, Luke 10, 19, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions, crush them, nothing will injure you. Bless God. <clears throat> I was just telling you about standing fast. Let's look at some scriptures. Ephesians 6, 13 and 14, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, and then he goes into the armor. We we'll look at that armor at another time. Right now, I just want to focus on standing. Galatians 5 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again by the yoke of bondage. In order to stand in victory, you have to stand in liberty. That means don't give in to the spirit of the law, bondage. I don't want to say this here. This is so important. <clears throat> a lot of Christians, I realize, don't understand the difference between law and the law. <laughs> right? Law and the law. Yes, we have laws that we have to keep, even as Christians, born again, believers in Christ, New Testament, grace, you know, the covenant of grace, dispensation of grace. Of course, there are laws. Of course, there are rules and principles that we have to abide by. The, the, the whole New Testament is replete with, with, with laws, rules, principles, regulations that we have. Of course, we have to keep laws, keep the word of God, the instructions of God. Of course, we do. When we Bible teachers and preachers, when we talk about the law and not keeping the law, we are speaking about the Mosaic covenant. Please understand that. God deals with covenants. There are seven major biblical covenants, right? Named after the mediator of each covenant. The Adamic covenant, Adam. The Noahic covenant, Noah. The Abrahamic covenant, Abraham. The Davidic covenant, David. Right? The Jesuit covenant, one and two. Right? The Mosaic covenant, Moses. Right? The Jesuit covenant, Jesus Christ, of course. The six, we are under the sixth covenant, right? Under the covenant of grace, the new covenant. All right, there's one more to come in the future, the, the kingdom covenant that will be enforced during his thousand year millennial reign. All right, so there are major covenants and God doesn't deal with the human race unless he deals with us through a covenant. A covenant means they are specific, again, rules of engagement. <laughs> That's literally what the covenant is all about. Specific guidelines and regulations, how God is going to respond and react to us, right? And how we ought to respond and react to God. Right, there are rules of engagement. That's what a covenant basically is. All right, so God deals with us through covenant. So when we say when we talk about the law, and we're not under the law. We're speaking about the old covenant, which is done away with the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that God made with Israel through Moses. That covenant is done, <clears throat> no longer in force at all. <clears throat> We are under a new and different covenant. Hebrews calls it, calls it a new and better covenant based upon better promises. Glory to God. And this is what the scripture verse is saying here, right? Galatians, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Free from what? Free from the old covenant. Free from the Moses law. We are free from that, right? Free to do what? Sin? No, of course not. Free to be holy, free to be righteous, free to live in love and purity. Understand something, people. The standard of holiness 
under the new covenant is a higher standard than the old covenant. Apparently, Christians don't understand that. They think when we say we're not under law, it gives us a license to sin. That is utter bilge, tripe, nonsense, rubbish, and garbage. The principles, the guidelines, the rules, the regulations under the new covenant are stricter than under the old. One simple example, under the old covenant, it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. <clears throat> Don't commit adultery. <clears throat> right? So a man married to a woman, don't go out and have relations with another woman. Don't commit adultery. And once he did that, he was keeping the law. That's fine. Once he didn't go out, step out on his wife, okay, and have relations with another woman, he was keeping the law. Do you get it? Here's what that, That's what the Old Testament says, Moses' law, don't commit adultery. Here's what the New Testament says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Which rule is harder to keep? Just don't step out on your wife or love her like Christ loved the church. Which is harder? Which is more of a higher standard, a higher moral fiber? Which one? A man who doesn't commit adultery just doesn't commit adultery. That doesn't mean he likes his wife or loves his wife. He could be a, 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 a fool at the, in home, at the home. He could be a, 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 a terrible person. He could be abusing his wife in the house, just not committing adultery. He could be a terrible father, a terrible husband, but he's not committing adultery. <laughs> but when the Bible says, hey man, love your wife like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He literally died. He gave his life so that his church, his bride, his wife might live. That's how husbands ought to love their wives under the new covenant. Which one is a higher moral standard? Don't be deceived. We are not under the old, we are under the new. It's a better covenant based upon better promises. And it's a higher standard of living. So don't spout ignorance. Please stop it. Having said that, the Bible does speak about liberty in Christ under the new covenant. Liberty under the new covenant. We are not hemmed in by a lot of specific rules and laws and regulations as the old covenant believers had. Slaying a lamb, going to a, a particular feast in a particular place at a particular time, right? You can't wear a garment with two different... Um, Fibers, cotton, and 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 um and wool. You couldn't do that. There's so many restrictions under the old covenant. We don't have those restrictions under the new covenant. Okay, there was clean animals and unclean. You couldn't eat certain meat, swine, for instance, shrimp, lobster. You couldn't eat those things under the old. Under the new, it says, "Hey, blessed." It. It's sanctified by the word of God and prayer, and all creatures are good to eat. Everything is good to eat. You see what I'm saying? So there's a certain amount of liberty under the new covenant that we did not have under the old. But when it comes to morality, right and wrong, and the standard of holiness, the new covenant is a higher standard, a higher standard, absolutely. So don't be deceived. <clears throat> Back to the point. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's how you stand. Remember, we're talking about the wrestling match. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers, right? The devil is fallen angels, his demons. But it's a wrestling contest. How do we win? How do we stand? How, how do we win? We stand. How do we stand? We speak the word of God. We speak the word of God in faith. We stand in faith. 2 Corinthians 1 24, by faith you stand. Glory to God. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. Faith is the currency in the kingdom of God. You want to buy anything, you want to get anything, you have to pay for it in the kingdom of God. God runs his kingdom like a business. He's a businessman. God is an entrepreneur. Some of you didn't know that. God is a businessman. He invested the life of one son that he may reap many more sons unto glory. That's ROI, return on investment. 
God is a businessman. The kingdom of God is a corporation. Hallelujah. You don't believe me? Check the parables. Jesus literally said he gave some X amount of talents and says, go and invest. He gave some a certain amount of pounds. Go and invest. Five and two and one pound and talent. Go and invest. He told them that. So faith is a currency in the kingdom of God. When the five foolish virgins ran out of oil and they went to the five wise virgins and they said, give us some of your oil. They said, no, we won't have enough for us and for you. Go and buy oil from them that sell oil. How is that? When oil represents the Holy Spirit. In that context, in that parable, oil represents the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? Or if you want to say the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the essence, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. So how could the five wise tell the five foolish, go and buy oil? Can you buy the Holy Spirit? No, you can't. Right? Elemas the sorcerer was, was rebuked sternly for that. Right? I think it was Peter one of them rebuked him and said, you try to buy the things of God, your money perish with you. You can't buy the things of God. So how could in that parable, the five wise tell the five foolish, go buy? Because you've got to understand that in the kingdom of God, the currency is faith. Faith is what you use to quote unquote, buy stuff. They're not really buying, but it's an exchange. It's, it's a battering system in the kingdom of God. It's not actual money, but it's a battering system. Anything you need from God, you have to pay for it with your faith. You exchange faith for whatever you need. That's how the five wives could tell the five foolish, go buy oil. Go buy the Holy Spirit. How you buy, how you get more of the Holy Spirit? Faith. <laughs> you have to extend or you have to exchange faith to get whatever you want from God. Faith is a currency in the kingdom of God. So how do you stand? In faith. <laughs> what is faith? Faith is knowing the will of God, believing in the power of God, trusting in the integrity of God, and then acting in agreement with God. That's how you apply faith. That's how you stand, right? Jesus said, speak to this mountain, say, get up and be planted into the sea. And if you don't doubt in your heart, it will obey you. Speak. Let's press on. James 4, 7, in the Young's literal translation, it says, be subject then to God, stand up against the devil, and he will flee from you. In the King James, you know it as, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Right? So we're talking about standing. How do you stand? How do you win this wrestling contest? You stand. How do you stand? The things you have to do, you have to stand in liberty. You have to stand in faith. You have to stand after you submit to God. Don't try to just stand in your own steam, your own ability. You will fail. We Christians under the new covenant operate under delegated authority. Delegated authority. Right? The source of our authority is God. Not our sense. doesn't originate within us. Anything we have to accomplish in this Christian life, it must be done in the context of a partnership. My will, God's power. There are things God can do and there are things God cannot do. I know that might mess with some of your theology, but yes, there are things God cannot do. He cannot choose for you. <laughs> if God could choose for a human being, everybody would be saved. Because it, he's not willing that any should perish. It is his will that all should come to eternal life. So if he could choose, then he would obviously choose life for everybody. Nobody will go to hell. That doesn't happen, cannot happen because God cannot choose for you. So there are things God can do and things he cannot do. There are things you can do and things you cannot do, right? You don't have the power to save yourself. The power comes from God, <laughs> right? We don't have the power to save ourselves. If we don't have the power to save ourselves, then clearly and obviously, we don't have the power to keep ourselves saved. It's the same principle. If you can't save yourself, you can't keep yourself saved. Right? So that's how we operate in tandem with the Holy Spirit, in tandem with God. We choose to do the right thing, and then we trust him for the power to accomplish it. <clears throat> That is how we live this Christian life. That is how we do everything <clears throat> in tandem with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> That's why we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He's on the inside of us, linked, merged, connected, fused with our own human spirit to make one spirit, both human and divine at the same time. Glory to God. So we choose our act of our will, but the power comes from God. And that's how we get things done. That's how you stand. You decide. He gives the power. You choose, he releases the power. 
and you get things done, you stand. <clears throat> right? So we are understanding the rules of engagement is what we're doing here. Stand fast. How do you stand fast? That's how you stand fast. Right? You speak the word of God over your situation in your circumstances. You speak, you release, you decree and declare the truth over the facts. Right? You stand in liberty. You stand in faith. Right? And you stand <clears throat> in partnership with God. <clears throat> Excuse me. You stand in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Bless God. <clears throat> Let's press on. <clears throat> Let's look at some of the meanings. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let's look at some of the meanings of the, the, some of the other words in that principal scripture that we quoted at the very beginning, Ephesians 6.12. <clears throat> For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That just means human beings. Flesh and blood, human beings. But against principalities and powers. Principalities. What does that mean? <clears throat> Arche. Arche. <clears throat> that word principalities means beginning, leader, head of angels or demons, magistracy, right? And a magistracy that is the office of a magistrate. What is a magistrate? A lay judge who administers the law. <clears throat> a lay judge who administers the law. Right? Excuse me. On the next page, I will get into some definitions and explanations of what these, these um, uh, titles represent, according to my understanding. So right now, I'll just run through the Strong's Concordance definitions for you, and then I'll give you my own understanding of it after. Powers. Exousia. Authority over mankind, authority to manage domestic affairs. The rulers, <clears throat> cosmocrator, cosmocrator, it means lord of the world, prince of this age, it also means the devil and his demons. The darkness, <clears throat> skotos, dark eyesight or blindness, metaphorically, it means ignorance of divine things and human duties and the accompanying ungodliness and immorality. Right? That's what it means. The world. <clears throat> oh, sorry. This world. <clears throat> this world. To two. Uh, eon. Eon. Uh, again, I'm not. I don't speak Hebrew or Greek. Right? <laughs> so I might be butchering some of these words. Forgive me. Right? It means this present age. This dispensation. Spiritual is. um. Pneumaticos. Pneumaticos. Uh, it means belonging to a spirit or, or being higher than man, but inferior to God. So a spirit or being that is higher than man is, is above human, but lesser than God, right? So right in the middle there, you have the, the realm of the uh, angels and demons. Wickedness <clears throat> is poneria. It means depravity, evil purposes, and desires. And, and high places, um, eporanios, is it means the heavenly regions, all right? Heavenly regions. <clears throat> so here it is now, I'm actually going to give you my understanding. Principalities is high-ranking fallen angels. We're talking about Satan and his kingdom, right? So we're trying to understand the rules of engagement. So we're trying to break down and define uh, who it is we're actually fighting, who we are wrestling against. Right? The first part of this teaching, we looked at wrestling, what it is, we defined it, we see how to wrestle, what do we do, we speak words and so forth. So we're going to look now at what it is we're wrestling against, who we're wrestling against, Satan and his minions, right? So the Bible actually defines them by using certain words, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and so forth. So we're looking to define these titles and see who or what they actually represent to know who or what we are actually uh, wrestling against, who we are standing against. It's not just Satan himself, but he has a whole empire, a whole kingdom. So who are these, who are these uh, minions? Who are these entities that we are wrestling, standing against? Principalities. Principality, again, and, and let me, let me, let me just um, <clears throat> put a little caveat here. What I'm, what I'm sharing with you here in this portion of teaching is my understanding of it, right? I'm not saying this is 100% accurate. This is exactly how it is. I, I don't, I'm not saying that and I can't say that, right? Because my revelation here is not full, 
<laughs> right? It's limited, okay? So as I gain more light and truth and knowledge and understanding, I will share, I will edify. But up to the point, up to this point, this is what I have, this is what I understand, okay? So it, it's not going to be full. I'm leaving room for more revelation, more light to pour in. Principalities, in my understanding, are high-ranking fallen angels, and they have jurisdiction over geographic areas like nations, states, cities, villages, and even burial plots. There's something I never saw until just a few hours ago when I was studying and preparing this, putting the final touches on this teaching, I saw this. See, this is how Satan's kingdom operates. Satan, the Bible calls Satan the god of this world. Right, the God of the world. So he's over the whole world. <laughs> right? Now, mind you, again, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So God owns the earth, <clears throat> planet earth. Right? And everything in it <clears throat> belongs to God. But Satan is temporarily in control of, of, of the earth and of the world. Temporarily in control. So there's a difference between who owns it and who is in control of it temporarily. Please understand that distinction. God is the owner. And at the end of, of it all, he will maintain and retain ownership, complete ownership, complete control. We read the end of the book. We know how, it, how it's going to work out, right? The devil is going to be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity, and God is going to reign and rule on the earth. We know that. But now, right now, present tense, the devil has a limited <clears throat> amount of time in which to flex and exercise a certain amount of control over the systems of the world, the societies, the organizations of the world, the systems, right? So within that context, his fallen angels that, that uh, rebel with him, okay, they have his, his, his kingdom has a, a hierarchy and different um, entities, be it fallen angels or demonic spirits, they have certain areas of jurisdiction, areas of authority, areas of control. And this is how I understand it principalities are those high-ranking fallen angels that uh, govern geographic areas, right? So like um, over uh, the Western Hemisphere, the, 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 um, the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, you may have a high-ranking uh, fallen angel. Over each continent, you might have a high-ranking uh, angel over the continent, over nations, right? And let's take America as an <clears throat> example. So you might have a high-ranking uh, uh, fallen angel over the entire North American region, that's Canada and the United States, right? Then under him, you would have one for Canada, one for the, uh, the United States, right? Then let's take the United States, right? Under that one for the whole United States, you'll have one for each state, 50 states, right? And each angel, each fallen angel <clears throat> would have that as his jurisdiction. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that that particular fallen angel, his job, if you will, his ministry, if you will, his purpose is to bring chaos, confusion, right? The, the, the devil is all about kill, steal, destroy. That's what he's all about. Kill, steal, destroy. So all of his minions, they will be about this exact same thing to how, how much people they can kill, who, can, who they can destroy and what they could steal from people. Steal the peace, steal the joy, steal love, mess up marriage, mess up relationships, right? So I'm saying these demonic spirits, this is their area, their, their respective areas of jurisdiction to kill, steal, and destroy. Do you understand that? <clears throat> All right, let's, let's press on. So over every state, you'll have a, a fallen angel. Over every city and every state, right? Over every tongue, every village, you will have, and it goes down like that. There's a hierarchical structure, right? And what I saw today that I never saw before, since we're talking about geographic areas, jurisdiction over geographic areas, I even saw that there are specific um, uh, fallen angels, right? That might be over even a burial plot. Think about it. <laughs> it's a plot of land. It's a geographic area, a plot of land, you see? And, and, and they would be, because you see, I was involved in your cult, <clears throat> years ago before I became a Christian, obviously, right? And so I learned certain things and I was privy to certain information. And one of the things that people do who are involved in the occult, right? They go into the cemeteries and they invoke demonic spirits. They go into the cemeteries, you see? Because these areas are highly charged 
with evil spirits and demonic entities. So I saw this here, but I never saw this before, that they will be over specific burial plots and just there to kill, steal, and destroy, right? To work their, their depraved evil, whatever it is they do, they, they, they will be doing that, okay? So <clears throat> powers will be over people. Principalities will be over geographic areas. Powers will be over people. So people would be governments, organizations, families, and individuals. You see, just as how each human being that is born has a particular guardian angel that God assigns to that person, I believe that the devil has a demonic spirit specifically assigned to that person as well. You see, and just how we see it in, in the movies and the cartoons, you have the angel on this side and the devil on this side, right? <laughs> of course, it wouldn't be like exactly like that. But similarly, you have a guardian angel and you have a demonic spirit from the devil, right? And depending on who is going to <clears throat> be able to do what in your life, it depends on your will, your choice. <laughs> when we make good godly decisions, we empower our guardian angel to do his job better. When we make bad decisions and we, we give in to the flesh and to the devil, obviously we are going to empower or give liberty to that demonic spirit to do the bad things that he wants to do. So our will, our choice, that's the part God cannot do for us. We have to choose, right? But I'm, I'm just trying to show you how the Satan's kingdom is structured here right now, right? He just looks at what God does. And just imitates. That's all Satan does. He's an imitator, an imposter. Uh, he, he, he's not a creator. He cannot create anything. So exactly how God has his kingdom organized, Satan tries to organize his kingdom exactly the same way. Right? The rulers of the darkness of this world, those specifically in charge of demonic propaganda, deception, manipulation, disinformation. Right? Under this heading, you would find spirits of religion and false doctrine. You see? They are, so, in other words, Satan has a whole contingent of evil spirits. And their one job, their one purpose is to blind the minds of men, blind the minds and the hearts of human beings so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is it you have been telling some of your family members and loved ones about Jesus for decades and they just can't see it? Some of them, they, they consider themselves atheists or agnostics or whatever. Right, some of them involved in false religion. Not religion. There's no false religion. Religion. Because Christianity is not a religion. Right? Some of them involved in religion. And they just can't, they just can't seem to see it. <coughs> no matter what you say or do. That's the work of these um, rulers of the darkness of this world. <clears throat> right? Remember, if we go back now to our definitions here. Rulers. Right? The devil and his demons. Darkness is <clears throat> metaphorically ignorance of divine things and human duties and the accompanying ungodliness and immorality. That's what darkness is. You see it? Dark eyesight or blindness. You see it? Right. So come back here now, the rulers of the darkness of this world, that's what they're doing. They're blinding the eyes of, of people and they're causing disinformation. They're causing, you know, spirits of religion, false doctrine, right? spiritual weakness in high places. <clears throat> These are wicked spirits in heavenly regions, right? A fallen angel over every galaxy, every planet, and every astronomical event. Again, never saw this before until today when I was going through this and I was breaking this down and trying to figure out, you know, what these things are, what they're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Spiritual belonging to a spirit or being higher than man, but inferior to God. That's an angel, right? Wickedness, depravity, evil purposes and desires. High places, Iporanios, the heavenly regions, right? That's the meaning in the Greek. So come back here now. Spiritual wickedness in high places are actual wicked spirits. Again, high-ranking uh, fallen angels that Satan has put in charge over heavenly regions. What is a heavenly region? Um uh, a fallen angel over every galaxy, planet, and astronomical event. Now, <clears throat> there are the Bible talks about three different heavens, all right? Three different heavens, heavens one, two, and three. And let me just break this down for you quickly.
2 Corinthians 12, 2 says, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago, whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. So right here, Paul is talking about the third heaven. Psalm 115, 16 in the, uh, I think there's the International Standard Version. It says, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but he gave the earth to human beings. Now, the word highest here is what I think, what you call a superlative, right? This means it's more than, it's three or more. If you say high, one, higher, two, highest, three or more, right? So if the Bible talks about the highest heavens, we know there are at least three. And then we come back to 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Paul says, I was caught up to the third heaven. So these two scripture verses confirm there are at least three heavens, right? And I believe there are three heavens because uh, Sam's talking about the highest. You can't go more than highest. Highest heaven. And Paul talks about the third heaven, okay? So <clears throat> what is the three heavens? <laughs> it's very simple. The third heaven is the throne room of God, the realm that God inhabits. It's like his bedroom. It's like his, his own private domain. Right. Heaven is just a different realm, by the way. Heaven itself is a spiritual realm, right? We have this physical, natural universe, right? We have the planet Earth. We have different uh, galaxies and planets and whatnot, okay? That's the whole physical universe. And then we have a spiritual universe, okay? So in that spiritual universe, you may have planets as well, right? I don't know for sure. I'm just I'm sharing, this is my understanding. You may have more than one planet or whatever, but it's at spiritual dimension is what it is, okay? Within that spiritual dimension, you have where God's throne is located, the highest heaven, the third heaven. That's the realm where only holiness dwells. There's no sin allowed there, okay? That's the highest heaven. That's where God's throne is, is uh, the Father's throne, and Jesus' throne right next to him on the right side. That's where that is, okay? That's the third heaven. The first heaven is actually the atmosphere surrounding the earth and outer space, the natural physical realm beyond the planet earth. That's the first heaven. The first heaven is divided into two layers, as, as it were, right? The atmosphere surrounding the earth and then outer space. So the first heaven is physical, natural, and is divided into two layers, the atmosphere surrounding the earth and outer space. Spiritual, the spiritual dimensional call heaven, it's the same thing. There are two layers, if you will, or two regions, if you will, right? So there's the throne room that I just mentioned, and then there's a lower region of heaven. We refer to as the second heaven, the second heaven, right? And I, I'm seeing my time going. So this teaching would have, we'd have to pick this back up next week. But I'll just conclude this part of the teaching so I won't just leave you hanging, right? But we'll pick this up next week because there's a whole lot <laughs> to unpack here, right? So I'll just, I'll just conclude this part and then we'll pick this back up next week. Three heavens. Highest heaven, third heaven, God's throne room. First heaven, the physical realm, the physical natural realm. Divided into two layers, the immediate atmosphere around the earth, where you have the stratosphere and the mesosphere and, and, and that kind of thing, right? And then you have outer space, right? Where you have the galaxies and the planets and whatnot. That is the first heaven, the two layers. Spiritual heaven also has two layers, the second and third heaven. The, 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 the second heaven, that is a realm in which Satan still has access to. The Bible describes him as the prince of the power of the air, right? It also talks about in the book of Daniel, <clears throat> right here, <clears throat> Daniel 10, 13. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Gabriel, the archangel, is speaking. And he says, for 21 days, the spirit prince, that is the, the, the fallen angel over the kingdom of Persia, blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Another translation actually says the angel prince of the kingdom of Persia. Persia. Daniel 10, 20 says, he replied, do you know why I have come? Gabriel is talking to Daniel. He says, do you know why I have come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. 
And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. So Gabriel is an archangel. He's, an, he's a holy angel in the service of God. And he's talking about fighting against the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. See, this now ties in to what I was just showing you here. Principalities over geographic areas like nations, states, cities, villages, and so forth. The prince of Persia that, that Gabriel is talking about is a high-ranking fallen angel, a principality. That's his rank. He's a principality over the nation of Persia, which is today either Iran or Iraq. I can never remember which one. I think it's Iraq, right? And then, of course, the pre you mentioned the prince of Greece or Grecia, right? Which would not be correspond to the, the literal nation of Greece that we know today would be a, 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 a bigger area, right? But the point is, Gabriel, the archangel, is talking to Daniel and he's explaining to him that since Daniel started fasting 21 days, he, Gabriel, was released from heaven. That is the third heaven, right? But the throne room of God is he was released from heaven to bring the message to Daniel. But he couldn't reach Daniel for 21 days. Why? He was stopped. In other words, he when, he, when Gabriel left the third heaven, he had to travel through an area before he got to earth. The first heaven, earth. Before he got to earth, he had to travel through a region. And in that region, he had to stop and fight. Why? Because the devil and his fallen angels still control that region. That's the second heaven. When Gabriel left the third heaven, he had to travel through the second heaven to get to Daniel, to get to earth. And he had to stop and fight. If he didn't have to tra travel through that area, why would he stop the fight? He would just go around it. He couldn't go around it. He had to travel through the second heaven. You see, there are three heavens. One, two, three. And to get from the third heaven to the first heaven, you got to travel through the second heaven. Again, this is my understanding of how things are. I'm not saying I have the fullest of revelation on it. But if you compare scripture with scripture, this makes sense. Okay? So the prince of the Persia, the prince of, of Persia, all right, um, is a, a high-ranking fallen angel called a principality that has uh, control or authority over the kingdom of Persia. Same thing with the kingdom of Greece, right? Mm -hmm. And again, as I explained to you, these are fallen angels in service of Satan, the devil. So their job would be to pervert, to, to disrupt, to, for, to bring calamity, chaos, kill, steal, and destroy. Okay? So when he saw Gabriel heading to earth, right, to bring this message to uh, Daniel, he stopped him and they had to do battle up in the heavenlies, right? They had to do battle. And he was kept there for 21 days until Michael, right? The other archangel came and took over the battle with the Prince of Persia and released Gabriel to come and bring the message to Daniel. <laughs> you see it? So there's war in the heavenlies. <laughs> war in the heavenlies, right? But basically, there are three heavens, first, second, and third heaven. First heaven, the atmosphere surrounding the earth and outer space, physical and natural. The third heaven, God's throne room, where his, his throne is and, and, and the streets of gold and the river of life and all these things described in the book of Revelation. The third heaven, all right? Sin can dwell there, holiness alone, okay? But um, there is a region called the second heaven. If you look at the book of Job, I didn't put the scriptures here, but the book of Job, it says, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves to God and Satan came also amongst them. Now, the sons of God, obviously, are angels of God, right? So the angels came to present themselves to God, right? It, they wouldn't be on earth, obviously. But it, it, that wouldn't make any sense. It had to be in, 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 a, in the spirit realm. They are spirit beings. God is a spirit. It would take place in the spirit realm, right? So the angels came to present themselves to God, and Satan came amongst them. So we know Satan is not going up to God's throne room. He ain't going there. So where? <laughs> where is he going to present himself to God in the spirit realm, the second heaven. That took place in the second heaven, right? That spiritual region, that, that region of the heavenlies, that is not the third heaven where God's throne is, where only holiness dwells, and it's not the physical heaven out of space or the, the atmosphere around the earth. No, no, no. It's a second heaven, right? So that's it. <laughs> that's what I have for you today, bless God, right? On next week, We'll pick up right here. We'll continue and we'll we continue unpacking how Satan's kingdom is structured, 
how it operates so that we will understand, get a better understanding of who and what it is we are wrestling against. That is what we are doing. Okay. The first part of our teaching, we looked at uh, this scripture verse here, Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers and so forth. We looked at the meaning of wrestle. We looked at the analogy between natural wrestling, spiritual wrestling, right? We saw it means to stand and how you stand, you speak in faith and so forth, right? We got all that. We talk about standing in faith, standing in liberty, standing after you submit to God. Wonderful. Then we began to look at a definition of these different classes and categories of spiritual beings that we are wrestling against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places, okay? And we ended up by looking at the fact that there are three different heavens, all right? There are heavenly regions, and there are three different uh, uh, heavens. First heaven, physical. Second heaven, lower heaven, uh, spiritual realm, where uh, Satan still have access to, his fallen angels have access to, all right? And then the third heaven where God's throne is actually located. So that's what I have for you today. Bless God. Again, we'll pick this up on next week. But for now, God bless you. If you have any statements, comments, suggestions, or testimonies, the floor is open.